Hey, how's it going? I hope y'all are having a great energy comp so far. I know there are a lot of awesome workshops earlier in the week and we're hearing from so many great speakers right now. So I'm really honored uh, to be a part of them and be able to talk to y'all a little bit about Angular Forms. I don't know about you all, but um, sometimes in technology, I feel like we have a lot of choices and it can be really stressful trying to make sure that we make the right decision. And it reminds me of those choose your own adventure books where you can make a decision and then go to a certain page number. But if you're anything like me, you always worried that you chose a not really interesting uh, way to go about in the story. And so you would flip back and see what the other pages felt. And I feel like we can't necessarily always do that in technology, but I wanted to maybe help y'all out a little bit um, in figuring out how to make the right choice, choice with what form module you might consider using. Uh, so today I'm going to be reading to y'all what I'm going to call a modern angular fairy tale. Before we get started, I will be your narrator. My name is Jennifer Wadella. You can follow me on Twitter at like OMG at Svetty. I'm the director of Angular development at a consulting company called Batovi. I mean, Angular GDE, and some people jokingly call me the queen of Angular forums. I love to speak at tech conferences, brew kombucha, and I have become quite the crazy plant lady. Um, lots of pandemic time to water my house plants. So excited to be here with y'all today. And uh, like so many fairy tales, Mine too begins with a once upon a time. So here we go. Once upon a time, there was a princess, a web princess. She liked to build web applications for Angular, in Angular for the villagers in her kingdom and watch the real housewives of Salt Lake City in her spare time. Her kingdom was peaceful and her villagers were happy. But one day, an evil startup sorcerer came and put a curse upon the kingdom that froze everyone's websites and open source contributions because he was jealous they would create competition for his new application. He set up shop in a nearby castle, zipped up his fleece Patagonia vest, and looked into his magic mirror. Mirror, mirror, on the wall, who will get the highest valuation of them all? He asked his magic mirror. A cloudy face appeared in the mirror and spoke. You will not get the highest valuation, or any valuation at all, unless you build me an application to collect information about users' favorite musicals. But the sorcerer did not know how to build web applications, and angri angrily raged that the kingdom would remain cursed forever. The princess knew she had to do something, so she went to the sorcerer and begged him to release the villagers, but he refused. Thankfully, the princess was clever. She told the sorcerer she knew how to code and asked the sorcerer if she completed the application, would he release the kingdom? Thankfully, he agreed. The first task, he said, is to build me a form where users can choose their favorite musical from a list of choices. Easy enough, said the web princess. But that's not all, said the sorcerer. I also want users to have to enter their favorite song from the musical they selected. And I don't want them to be able to use the song input until they have chosen a musical. The princess understood and set off to figure out how to accomplish the task. She left the sorcerer's palace and started down a path and soon encountered a fork in the road. One pathway looked very old, but polished and gently used. The other pathway looked worn down and well used. She could even see recent footprints in the dirt. Each pathway was marked with a sign. The first, the older looking path, was marked template driven forms. The other, the more recently used path, marked reactive forms. Uncertain and not wanting to pick the wrong path, the princess peered down as far of each of the paths as she could go, but she wasn't able to see around the first curve. She didn't want to choose the wrong path. What would that mean for rescuing her kingdom? If she chose wrong, she would forever doom the villagers. She took a breath and gently stepped down the well-trodden path marked reactive forms. She walked down the path for a few minutes and then stumbled upon a piece of parchment. Curiously, she picked it up and read reactive forms module. She studied the code closely, looking at all the different declarations and exports used by the reactive forms module. Something clicked. Ah, the princess said, I can use the form group and the form control directives to start to build my form. So she created a form with a form group called my form. Inside of here, she had another group called my favorites that she would use to capture the information. She had an idea this was not the first task that the wizard was going to ask her to accomplish. 
Inside the My Favorites form group, she had two different form controls. One, to collect the information about the user's favorite musical. The other, to create their favorite number from that musical. Inside her example form, she took advantage of the form control and form group directives provided by the reactive forms module. She used the form group directive to bind her parent level form group, and she used the form control name directive to bind the different form controls from that form group. She knew that by using form control name, she could pass in a string, and that string would look inside the parent form group it was bound to and look for a control by the name of musical or by number. Now, the princess wondered out loud as she continued down the path, how do I enable or disable inputs whenever I need? She understood that when a user entered in a value in the musical, the number input should then become available for that user to interact with. At that moment, the woods opened up and revealed a lake with a boat. As the princess looked closer, words were scrawled on the side of the boat. Abstract control is the key. Abstract control is the key. What a strange thing to say, said the princess. But as she looked down at her magical documentation parchment, more words appeared. The abstract control class, from which all form classes are extended. Okay, well, maybe not all form classes, but it's way more dramatic to say it this way. And this is a fairy tale after all. The princess studied the abstract control class and realized there were a lot of different properties and methods available for her to use to interact with her form controls. Both the form group and the form control that she are currently using extend this base class and all of these different properties and methods were available to her. She was delighted to see that there was an enable and a disable method available on the abstract control class. She could use these to complete her functionality. In this code, I can subscribe to the value of my musical control. If there's a value, I can go ahead and set my number control to be enabled. And if there's not a value, I can set my number control to be disabled, the princess realized, and she quickly typed out her code. As she was playing with the form to ensure that the behavior was as she expected, there was a poof and the sorcerer appeared. You have completed my form, he exclaimed. Yep, here you go, said the web princess. The sorcerer played with the form but seemed unsatisfied. What if the musical number the user enters isn't actually from the musical they selected? I simply cannot have that. I want to validate the number that they have entered is actually from the musical by checking against my magical musicals API. It should also be very obvious to the user that the whole section is invalid when they are wrong. And with another poof, he disappeared. The princess sighed and gazed across the lake. As she looked across the water, she saw a small cabin with a sign, Validation Lodge. That seemed like the next logical place to go, so she jumped in the boat and rowed towards the cabin. Upon entering the cabin, she saw an old book labeled Validators. As she flipped through the book, she realized all of these validators were able for her to access and given to her just throughout Angular. She could determine if a form control should be required. She could even determine if that control should have a min or a max value or she could pass a regex into the pattern validator and do whatever she wanted to match against different values. This was really great. As she continued to flip through the book, she came to a blank page with the words custom validator at the top with an example implementation. She realized that she could create her own validator to check against the sorcerer's API. She went back to her application and typed in the following code. She created a validate musical number function, which took the string that it would compare against and then called the API to determine if that musical passed in by that string parameter actually contained the number value from the form control. Then when she knew she wanted to use this validator on the number control, she called the set validators method, method and passed in this validator. Now that my validator is working, the princess thought, I need a way to show the user the whole section is invalid. And she thought back to the available directives in the reactive forms module. She remembered digging around and seeing something called ng control status. This is a directive that is automatically applied to Angular form controls that sets CSS classes based on a control status. She realized there is an ng control status directive and an ng control status group directive that handled adding places based on a control status. 
If a form control had a status of invalid, the ng invalid status class would automatically be imply applied. Instead of having to create her own validation in classes, she could simply add styling using the ng valid and ng touched classes, and they would apply to her invalid form controls and her invalid form groups containing invalid form controls. She knew that a form group would be marked as invalid if any of the controls inside it were marked as invalid as well. She played around with her application to make sure that the behavior was working as expected, and it was very clear to the user when a whole section of the form was invalid. And as she watched the ng-serve command live reload in her browser with her last edit, the sorcerer appeared and another poof. I have one final task for you, the sorcerer said. I want users to be able to list different actors they think should be cast in the musical. And add a button to the form to allow users to add as many cast members as they might like, and delete them as well. They must declare a role and an actor for the form to be valid. Okay, the princess thought that's, that's an interesting requirement, but I'll see what I can do. The princess remembered the form array directive from her magical documentation and realized she could use this array to have a dynamic number of cast members. In her form, she created an ng4 loop where she iterated over the form control she would create for the cast group. Inside of each of those, she bound to a form group directive, and so she could continue to use the form control name directive to pass in a string relative to that form group. So for every form group, there would be a role form control and an actor form control. She created her form array on her public form and started initially with just one form group. Then she added a function, add cast member, where she could automatically push new form groups to this array as she needed for the user to be able to interact with the application in the way the sorcerer had described. As she looked more closely at the form array documentation, she realized in addition to the push and insert at methods that allowed her to dynamically update the form array, there was also a remove at. The remove at method takes an index and she knew she could access that index inside of her ng4 loop and use that to remove items from her array at certain spots. She played with her form to make sure it acted as she expected, where all the form controls were required and she could both add and remove cast members as needed from her form. But before saving the last line of code, she paused. What if I complete this code, she thought, the sorcerer will reappear, and what if I chose the wrong form path? She quickly closed her laptop, threw it into her backpack, sprinted out of the cabin, hopped into the boat, and rode back across the lake. She retraced her steps until she found that first fork in the road. She adjusted the straps of her backpack and set down the path marked template-driven forms this time, determined to see if she had made the right choice. A little ways down the path, she discovered another piece of paper labeled template-driven directives. As she studied the paper, she realized that there were different directives available for her to use inside of the template-driven forms module. Okay, the princess said, it looks like I can use this ng model directive to manage controls in my form. With the two-way data binding, Angular can track the value and the user interaction of the control and keep the view synced with the model. She pulled out her laptop, sat on a tree log, and began to type. She created a member on her component that would reflect how she wanted to bind to her form in her template. Inside of her form, she used the ng model control the same way she used the form control name directive previously to bind to the relevant members of her form. She could also use the ng model group directive to track the status of the parent object that contained the musical and the number controls that she was using with the ng model directive. Now I need to figure out how to enable and disable these inputs. And I don't seem to have access to the form control directly to call them. So how can I do this? She looked back at the documentation and realized there were also directives available to disable or enable inputs, and she could access them using template variables. So on her musical number, she passed a disabled directive where she pulled the value of the musical ng model value. And this would allow her to disable or enable that form, that form control, that input as needed. Next, she knew she needed to validate. 
And she already knew about the already available validation directives that she stumbled across in the validation cabin. But now she needed to create her own validation directive instead of just a function. She was able to create this implementing validator and build her own validator function that she could bind on a directive and use on any input that this kind of validation would be required. She implemented this validator in her template and passed in the value that she wanted to check against to know how to call the API. So she had completed the validation part of this exercise. Now I need to figure out how to dynamically add form inputs for the cast members using ng-model. I know when I use ng-model on an element, I must define a name attribute for that element, and Angular uses the assigned name to register that element with the ng-form directive that is attached to the parent form ele element. That means I'll probably have to access the index again in my ng4 loop to create those unique names. Before she did that, she added the cast members array to her form model object. And then inside of her template, she created a custom name value, uh, role underscore, and then the index, and then was able to bind the ng model to her role or to her actor, depending on which control she cared about. Now that she has this hooked up in her DOM and every time a new cast member is added, it will be reflected in the form group, she needed to wire up that functionality. So on her add button with the add cast member method, she created some logic that would add to her form. As the princess was typing these last lines, a strong wind came through the clearing and blew her papers away. Oh no, she cried and chased after the papers. She caught them in her hands. But as she looked at them side by side, she noticed something strange that she hadn't noticed before. Both were very small modules that consumed and exported the internal forms shared module and simply used different directives. Wow, directive forms module and the template driven modules are almost identical except for the directives they use. Both ng model and form control directives rely on the abstract control directive to do their magic. She thought to herself, I can use reactive forms or template driven forms to solve my problem, the princess said. And with that, there was another proof and the evil sorcerer appeared. But right before her eyes, he transformed into a handsome prince. Your openness to different approaches and not shaming technology choices has broken the spell on me, he said. And they lived happily ever after, implementing all sorts of different form control options. Now everyone can live in harmony, and with that, the curse he had placed upon the kingdom and the villagers was lifted, and everyone coded happily ever after. So what is the moral of our Angular story, do you ask? There are plenty of different ways to solve problems in Angular, and whichever form module works best for you and your team is the best way for you to implement your form solutions. I hope you had fun with me on this adventure. If you have any questions about the reactive forms module or the forms module, these slides are available at chooseyourownformadventure.jenniferwoodella.com. You can always email me or tweet at me. I'm happy to talk to you about form questions all day long. Have a great rest of your conference, you wonderful human beings.